Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me. My name is Victor LaBarbera. I think I know most of you. If I haven't, if I don't know you, please introduce yourself to me afterward. I'd love to like meeting new folks. So, uh, yeah, when they first asked me to come here Tuesday morning, I was thinking I might be talking to uh, just Mike and Marcel. <laughs> I wasn't sure if there was going to be anybody here. I'll just be honest. But you are, well, I just wasn't sure how dedicated you were or how unemployed you were. So, uh, so it, you're one or the other. So you're dedicated or unemployed. So whichever camp you're in, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, we'll do Let's Make a Deal, but not today. Uh, there, there'll be a time and place for that. And also, uh, if you were here last year at the family conference, last year the Lord had put it on my heart to do a um, marriage conference, marriage retreat. That is in the works, but it's not going to happen anytime real soon. So, I know. So, it's complicated. The marriage thing is it's just going to be a little bit more complicated. The other ones just kind of threw themselves together. This, this one, not so much. So, all right. So, it's funny. Uh, Father puts a lot of messages on my heart. So, I have like 50 messages prepared. Like, not prepared. I have like the titles of 50 messages on my phone in a file. Father gives me the title of a message, and I have an idea of what it looks like when he gives it to me. I get like a quick download, and I'm like, ooh, and I, and I write it down, and then it sits on my phone for sometimes a year, two, three years. And when they asked me to speak, immediately I was like, wait, I think I have a message called wilderness. And I look on my phone, and there it was, and I was like, what was that about? <laughs> oh, yes, and then it comes back to me, and then, so yeah, then I sit down, make an outline real quick, and here we are. So it made sense. Why the wilderness? Well, the children of Israel entered the wilderness during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So while we celebrate this week, they, you know, a time when they went into the wilderness, some of my favorite people in the Bible had wilderness experiences. So not only did people go in the wilderness, we have like a big picture, the children of Israel, like the macro level, they all went through the wilderness. But on a micro level, we have a lot of people in the Bible that had amazing wilderness experiences on an individual level that we'll go through. And myself, I've had an amazing wilderness experience. And I know many of you have a testimony too of a wilderness experience, not a going out in the, the mountainous, you know, arid regions, but you had a personal dry season where God took you out and spoke to you and you were delivered or something was revealed to you. So I believe everyone needs a wilderness experience. And I believe there is a lesson in the wilderness, a lesson that we can learn from the children of Israel and also some of our other, uh, the people we've seen in the Bible who went through the wilderness. Now, like I said, I have a list of things that I could talk on on my phone. I can show you 50 different topics that I one day want to get to or believe I will, Lord willing, when the time is right. And so there's lots of things in the Bible to discuss. There's lots of it's. There's lots of stuff to, to chase after. But there's only one person that really matters. So we can talk about the wilderness. We could talk about all these things. But if it doesn't ultimately point to Yeshua, then I really feel like the message missed the mark. Because it's really all about him and it's all about the gospel. And one thing I've been convicted of is that I want all my messages, even though they'll be about different things, different topics, things extracted out of the Bible, they ultimately need to point to him. Because... I'm not trying to make you smarter sinners or more knowledgeable pagans or whoever you, you know. Yo, Marcel's giving me a look. <laughs> see, he, see, he takes everything so personal. I wasn't even talking to him and he took it personal. But ultimately, he has to point to him. If it doesn't bring us closer to him, then this message is in vain. And so the heart of this message is to bring us closer to Yeshua. But in order to do that, we have to go through the wilderness. And that's why I'm going to be talking about what I'm going to be talking about. So this message on the wilderness is not really about the wilderness. It's about who we encounter in the wilderness. And that's our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. And this goes with everything. I see you guys have some prepping and canning classes this week. Uh, there's classes on, I don't know, was there sauerkraut or there was sauerkraut? Cool. I love sauerkraut. Uh, yeah, I love all that stuff. I moved from Chicago not knowing how to do anything. 
except count things because I have an accounting degree. And when I moved here, I inherited 12 acres of farm property. And I didn't know how to do anything. My dad didn't even own a hammer or a screwdriver. And anything was broken, he called somebody. So I have no practical skills to operate a farm. But the Lord has shown me how to do these things and YouTube. So between the Father's revelations and YouTube, I'm in a good place. And then he's put me in touch with many of you fine people who know how to do the things that I'm learning how to do. So yes, I've been learning how to homestead. I have, now I have a greenhouse. I have some animals. I keep bees. You know, I do a lot of these things, and this is all great. But we can learn all this stuff. And yeah, we can build bigger barns, and then when we are crucified for our beliefs, we can die with full bellies and, food, and, and canned food in our barns. Yay. But that's not the reason he wants you to learn this stuff. He wants you to learn it because it's for someone else. It's not just for you. I have a brother that the Lord showed him colloidal silver and how to make it himself. And now he's got a colloidal silver ministry where he is giving it out to people. And I know somebody who does a lot of canning, and they have a canning ministry, and they are canning for other people who have less. So I just felt like the Lord wanted me to, to share that, and I think you guys already knew that. There wasn't a rebuke or a correction. I think you guys were already there. But if you were just, you know, I was just supposed to share it, so I'm just being obedient to what the Spirit led me to say on that. Because 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So let's do all things unto him, including our sauerkraut and our canning and our beekeeping and our animal husbandry, goat milk, whatever, whatever you're doing. It's awesome. There's definitely in this movement a return to his ways. We're definitely seeing that, not just here in this fellowship, in this congregation. We're seeing that across the world, that people... He's calling people out of the cities, out of the man-made, out of Babylon, out of all the man-made stuff, and being now surrounded by his creation. And the heavens declare the glory of Elohim. They really do. When I lived in Chicago, I couldn't even see the stars at night. I could barely even see the moon. His time pieces that are in the heavens for us to know, the times and seasons, the Moedim, I couldn't even see them where I lived because it was either obstructed by man-made buildings or... Air, uh, air pollution, uh, light pollution. And now that I live where I live, I can see the Milky Way. I'm surrounded by nature and his creation. And I can see the fingerprints of my creator, my maker, on everything. And it's so amazing. And it's, and it's a testimony, too, because when I have family members from Chicago who aren't believers yet, and I get to tell them just how all these things happen, they all, they're all amazed. They're all amazed because they see the symbiotic system. They see how everything relies on one another. And it's order. It's not chaos. It's not random. It's design. So, no, it is wonderful. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this feast of, this feast of matzah, unleavened bread, where the children of Israel were led into the wilderness. They were taken out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Egypt. Thank you for taking us out of our personal Egypts, out of bondage and slavery. And you are bringing us to the promised land. And I pray that all my brothers and sisters here, if they never have encountered you in the wilderness, I pray that they will this week. I pray that this would be the week that they encounter you like never before, Lord. And I thank you, and I pray this message would be clear. I pray that young and old would understand it, and it would be the words from you, that these words would come straight from the throne room of heaven. And I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Let's see if my remote's on. Looks like it is. All right, one question. I got one question. So answer this honestly. If you could ask Yahweh one question right now, what would it be? Anybody? How does it, what? How does everything work? That's a good question. I like that. Anybody else got a question they would like to ask the Lord? Some people ask, like, why mosquitoes? But I don't think he, I think that was from the fall. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to blame that on him. I'm going to blame that on the fall. Will you take me with you? Ah, will you take me with you? So David is one of my favorite people in the Bible. This was one question he had from Psalm 27. He said, one thing I ask from Yahweh, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of Yahweh and to seek him in his temple. That's the one thing David asked. He wanted to seek him. He said, I ask that I can seek you and dwell in your house forever, to gaze on the beauty. I pray that when you 
have your wilderness experience, that you will see the beauty of Yahweh. Just like Moshe, when he said, show me your glory. He said this in the wilderness. He wanted to see the glory of Yah. And I pray that we too will see that. And for some of you, you don't even see Yahweh as beautiful. He is beautiful. That is his nature. He is love and he is beautiful. And I pray that you will see that. And that's the point of this wilderness. It's for us to seek his face. Like I said, just like Moshe did. And the revelation that the Father is going to show you in the wilderness is not just for you. You're going to share that experience for others. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the seas, and all were baptized into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We got started without you, is that right? I, can, I, I, tried to, I, tried to buy, I tried to buy you more time. Okay, I'm going to start over. Let's go back to the first slide. All right. I want to go back to the first part of this verse because, all right. I underline this part. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. I think the King James has accompanied them. I don't, we don't really ever talk about that, but does that mean what it sounds like it means? Like, was the rock moving along in the wilderness? It may have been. That's pretty wild. We don't really teach on that or think about that, but the rock may have been a moving rock. Okay, we know that rock was Messiah, but that rock, it says it right there, the rock was Messiah. Okay, so why were these things written? They're written for us as examples. The things that happened in the wilderness, in the book of Exodus, these things happened for us. Why? It says, so that we would not crave evil things. So we can learn from the lessons of the wilderness of the children of Israel, because they did some really stupid things, all right? It says, do not be idolaters, nor let us act immorally, nor let us try the Lord, nor grumble. Now, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's us. They're written for our instructions, not just the instructions of Torah, but to learn from their bad example. And they were a bad example. Now, I don't know about you. The first time I read the book of Exodus, I was just like shaking my head the whole time. I'm like, these people are stupid. These are the dumbest people I've ever seen. These are the dumbest, stupidest people. Then the second time I read Exodus, I'm like, yeah, I can see that. Then the third time I, the third time I read Exodus, I'm like, yeah, I do that. <laughs> Am I alone or is anybody like, have you, have you been there? Okay, like the third, like third or fourth time, then you're like, oh, okay, that's what we do. <laughs> We're not learning from this. <laughs> we were supposed to learn from this and not repeat it. <laughs> but that's what we do sometimes, right? We're stubborn too. I thought, oh, we got it all together. We're not like these stubborn, you know, they're, they're, they walk through the sea. They're following the fire. They saw all the plagues and they're grumbling. They got manna. They got all the things. They want quail. They want to go back to Egypt where the leeks and onions are by the Nile. And it's like, are you people serious? <laughs> You've got it made. You are seeing things that we would all dream of seeing, and yet it's not enough. But I realize we easily forget. We can easily forget. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're supposed to be in fellowship together. Because there's times I testify to somebody, and I'm telling them, when I'm testifying to them, I'm testifying to myself. I'm saying things that happened to me that I forgot happened to me. And I have to, I have to tell, I'm telling that person, but as I'm saying, my faith is building up because I'm like, oh, hot dog, that happened, yeah, glory to God. I started getting excited. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> so I need, I need it sometimes. <laughs> and you guys build me up when you guys tell me what the Father's done in your lives. So we need that. We need that constantly because we, we will forget. We got short-term memory, people. I, I, I mean, 
Just when I start thinking I'm smart, I realize how much I've forgotten. And uh, so, no, we need it. We definitely need it. We're stubborn. So, yeah, a lot of things happen in the wilderness. The Torah is written in the wilderness. The tabernacle was built in the wilderness. The ark was made in the wilderness. So let's talk about this wilderness. What exactly is this wilderness? So, yes, his, like I said, when I, when I talk about the wilderness, I'm going to use, I'm going to kind of flip-flop between meanings. So historically, like the big picture wilderness that we see in Exodus story, right? Children of Israel going through the wilderness. But then there's also the personal wilderness experience that each and every one of us will go through. So the word wilderness is mitbar in Hebrew, means wilderness, and in Arameos in Greek, which actually means solitary, desolate place. So Greek is a little funnier about it. So when you think of Yeshua goes to a solitary place, a lot of times he says he goes to a solitary place. Even one time when he's in the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee, he, he said they were in a solitary place in the Sea of Galilee. It's actually wilderness. So he was actually in the wilderness in the water. So it's not always... Uh, just a dry, mountainous place. And we're clicking. And we're clicking some more. I got a blue light when I click, but nothing's moving. Go fix it. We're good now? I'm still clicking. All right. So, yes, the wilderness is obviously a dead and desolate place. It's a remote place, far away from other people, from civilization. It's where Yahweh calls us to meet him. It's a place of sanctification and testing. It's where he refines us. It's like that refining fire. And oftentimes, we want to avoid it. Because we don't want to get burned, we, you know, or the things that we're carrying or bringing are going to get burned up. Maybe we're carrying along some baggage and some luggage, and it's just straw and stubble, and it's just going to burn up. And we don't want it to burn up. But if it's not of him, it's gonna, it, it's, if it, then it's going to burn. Let it burn. We need to go out there and be tested. A lot of people go through the wilderness. I'm pretty sure the children of Israel, when they went through the wilderness, I'm pretty sure there's some things they brought out of Egypt that they didn't bring all the way, that their children didn't bring into the promised land. They probably got a little heavy after a while and said, you know what, I probably don't need this. Has anyone ever moved after living in a place for a long time and you kind of go through that purge, you go through your stuff and you, you have so much stuff you didn't even know that you, had, you still had and you end up throwing it out and just like, I haven't used it. I didn't even know I had this. I haven't used this in five years. Why do I have this? And you pitch it, right? I think we have a lot of that kind of baggage, even spiritually, that we don't even know we have sometimes. And that's why we need to go into the wilderness and just drop it off and just let it just burn in the sun. It's also a place of revelation. It's also a place of restoration and new beginnings. So let me read Hosea. Hosea says this, Therefore I am going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. He's talking about Israel. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came out of Egypt. In that day, declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the name of the Baals from her lips. No longer, no longer will their names be invoked. So look at this. Our father is wooing us. He's saying, I'm going to lead her into the wilderness. Israel, after Israel has betrayed me and been unfaithful to me and done all these things, I'm going to lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her and be our, our maker. I'll, we'll be our husband. We will call him my husband. I think that's some beautiful language there. So there's intimacy in the wilderness. If there's a lack of intimacy in your relationship with the Lord, he might be calling you to the wilderness. And what else is in the wilderness? Safety. Okay? Safety amongst danger. 
In Deuteronomy 8.15, it said, He led you through the vast and terrifying wilderness with its venomous snakes and scorpions. A thirsty and waterless land, he brought you water from the rock of flint. And we know also that David took refuge in the wilderness from Saul. So he was safe in the wilderness, even though the wilderness can be a very dangerous place. So Revelation 12 says this. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. He gave birth to a son, a male. Probably should say she. But okay. A male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So I'm not going to get super deep into the meaning of this passage in Revelation, but yeah, I mean, I, I, my personal belief is that it's pointing to past and future, so I believe there's a, a future fulfillment of this to take place as well that hasn't happened yet. So uh, what that exactly looks like, I'm not 100% clear on, but I see that there will be a time where the woman is, is going to be led into the wilderness that's prepared for her by God. So God is preparing this place of safety for the church, perhaps, in the wilderness where she can be taken care of, where her needs will be taken care of. So that is something to look forward to. So here's my wilderness hall of fame. These are people who had their own personal wilderness experience. All right, so kind of went in biblical order. So this is not in a, this is not like a David Letterman top 10 list. So Hagar and Ishmael, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, that's an unusual one. Sometimes we think of, I, I, at least I do, sometimes I think of Hagar and Ishmael in a negative sense, um, just as far as like Ishmael uh, and Isaac, kind of look at Isaac as the son of promise and Ishmael not being, right? Being born of the slave woman. And, and, but God still loves Hagar and Ishmael because she flees into the wilderness twice. And both times she has an encounter with an angel and she has an encounter with the Lord. And they're led to water and they're kept alive in the wilderness. And then it says during Ishmael's life, Ishmael grew up in the wilderness, and it said God was with Ishmael in the wilderness. So we see God taking care of the needs, and we see an encounter with the Lord in the wilderness. Now, Rebecca, you're like, wait, Rebecca? So, oh, by the way, the Hagar one was Genesis 21. So Rebecca in Genesis 24, it's easy to miss because it doesn't say wilderness. But we have the servant of Abraham goes and goes to look for a bride for his son Isaac. He finds Rebekah, right? So here's what is easy to miss in the story, what people represent. The servant, the messenger, is the Holy Spirit. He is the Ruach. He represents the Ruach, okay? He's the Holy Spirit. When he gets to Rebekah, what does he give Rebekah? He gives her gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The servant now prepares her to meet her husband, right? They go on this long trip back from Rebecca's home now to Abraham's home. Where do they have to go on this long trip? They have to go through the wilderness. Now, if you were getting ready to marry somebody that you've never seen and never known in your whole life, and the only person who knew who that husband for you was, was this messenger who just brought you gifts and now is taking you along on his side, which, by the way, that's what the counselor, the mess, the counselor means in Greek, the paraclete is beside you, comes beside you. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. He's, take, he's taking her to meet her husband. What do you think happened in that trip? It wasn't a one-day trip. It probably took a, several weeks. She probably asked him questions. What is my future husband like? And he probably told her, he's a wonderful man, and he's very good looking, and he's going he's gonna to fall in love with you as soon as he meets you. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is introducing us to our husband that we have not met fully yet. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. And that's what this is. It is so beautiful and we can miss it if we don't, if we don't read between the lines and we don't pray before we read the scriptures. I, I just really, really am, would just tell you to read, when you read the scriptures, pray to God to open your spiritual eyes to see these things because there's so many layers, there's so many beautiful things and shadows and types in these scriptures. So yeah, John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whoever I said unto you. So yeah, that word is parakletos, right? Para is beside, kleto is to call. So like the Holy Spirit's calling us beside him. And that's what was happening to Rebecca. She was, her future husband was being revealed to her in this wilderness. Of course, Moshe, that's a famous one, Exodus 3.1. Right? It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. So right, we know, we know the story very well. He encounters God there. And I believe Moses was called out of Egypt and brought into the wilderness, one, to be prepared to lead the children of Israel through the wilderness. So now, not only does he know the land, but he has also, his heart's been prepared. He has already been removed from Egypt. He is no longer, well, he was never a slave. That's one of the reasons Yah called him, right? He didn't have that slave mind, that slave mentality. And now he has been sanctified. He's been sanctified from Egypt. He's learned to be a shepherd so he can shepherd the sheep that are coming out of Egypt. And with being a shepherd, we learn humility. So we learn humility in the wilderness as well. So Aaron, Aaron had a wilderness experience. He was called into the wilderness. In Exodus 4.27, it says, Yahweh said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moshe. So he met Moshe at the mountain of Elohim and kissed him. It's easy to miss that, that the first high priest is going to be called into the wilderness before the children of Israel will be as well. I think there's a reason for that. We have David in 1 Samuel 23.14 David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day, day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. So David found refuge and safety from Saul in the wilderness. For David, the wilderness was a place of testing. It was also a place of training. I love 2 Samuel 23. If you guys ever read it, it talks about David's mighty men. This was a place of training and discipleship where these men went into the wilderness... And they were trained, and they stayed in the cave of Adullam, and these guys went on to slay giants. David raised a generation of giant killers. These guys, read, yeah, you know, later on today, read 2 Samuel 23, the, the crazy things these guys did. But these guys were with David. You don't see these things with men that were with Saul. In fact, Saul, earlier in Samuel, says Saul's men didn't even have weapons. And to me, that is a picture of the modern-day church today is weaponless. And... We have to go into the wilderness. We have to go into the cave of Adullam. We need to go through the refining fire. We need to get tested and trained up and equipped. But again, it's not just for us. It's not just so you can just be up here. It's so you can bring people with you. Okay? This message isn't for you. Your wilderness experience is not just for you. David didn't, he wasn't just alone in, in the wilderness. He had other men that were faithful with him who learned beside him and trained with him. And they endured persecution together. So Elijah, in 1 Kings 19, famous encounter, right? He encounters Yahweh. But this was after Mount Carmel. So Elijah has this amazing mountaintop experience, pun intended, right? He has, you know, the, the altar, the, you know, the water, the fire, the, the prophets of Baal, all that stuff, right? He has this amazing experience. But yet, he goes into depression. Jezebel threatens to kill him. He goes into depression. He wants to die. And he, gets caught, he goes into the wilderness because he's depressed. Because a religious spirit will do that to you. The Jezebel spirit will do that to you. And sometimes we need to go into the wilderness. And what does he do? He goes up to the mountain. And Yahweh wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. And that's why we need to get in the wilderness so many times. Because he's not in the earthquake. He's not in the fire. He's not in the wind. We need to hear that small, still voice. That quiet voice. And it says, Yahweh passed by Elijah. It's the same language that we see with Moshe. That when Yahweh passed by Moshe, on that same mountain, he's passing by Elijah. And what happens? Elijah gets restored. Restoration takes place on that mountain for Elijah. And his identity is restored. He knows who he is, and he knows that he's not alone. He knows that God has restored a remnant. John the Baptist. So Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, There's a voice calling, Clear the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. And that is, we see the fulfillment of that in Matthew 3, 1. It says, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready for the way of Yahweh, make his path straight. So John the Baptist, who I believe, this is my opinion, may actually be the rightful high priest. Because we know that Caiaphas and Ananias are not. And we know that John had a dad who was a priest. So I believe that John maybe should have been the high priest. But he ain't in Jerusalem. He ain't at the temple. He's in the wilderness, paving a way for Yahweh, fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah. And people that want to know what's going on, what do they do? They're coming out to the wilderness. And what's he doing? He's baptizing in the wilderness. And he's calling people out of Judaism. He's calling people out of false religious strongholds. And they're coming out of Jerusalem. They're coming out of the religiosity and coming out into the wilderness to hear a prophet. John is out in the wilderness stripping them of the old so that they can receive the new from Yeshua. He is getting things ready. Because you can't receive new wine if you are an old wineskin. You can't receive it. You cannot receive the new until you let go of the old. And that's what the children of Israel had to do. Their purification through the wilderness. They had to let go. Yes, Yah freed them from Egypt. But their wilderness experience was to free them, to get Egypt out of them. They still had Egypt in here. Yeah, they were free from physical Egypt. They were free from Pharaoh's army. But they weren't free indeed. So he had to get the religion out of them. And that is what John is doing in the wilderness. Yeshua's first disciples, who were they? They were John's disciples. John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes, the sins of the, takes away the sins of the world. The, Andrew and Peter, these were people that followed John. Why are they the first disciples? Because they've already been in the wilderness. They've already been prepared. The ground has already been prepared to receive the seeds that Yeshua has to sow. So I had a wilderness experience back in like 2010, sitting in a church, and it's feeling kind of dry, and I'm realizing I'm not growing anymore, and I'm starting to ask the question that I think a lot of you have asked, there's got to be more than this, because I've been doing this for years, and I'm starting to hear the same messages, and I'm not seeing the growth. Yeshua said, you will do greater things, and I'm not seeing even good things. So he's either a liar or we are having a problem here, folks. I'm seeing a lot of things in my Bible that we're not doing. I'm seeing a lot of religiosity. I'm seeing a lot of man-made things. I'm seeing a lot of bondage. And it's just not adding up. So I prayed and I heard a voice. And it said, leave quickly, leave quietly. And I'd been there a long time. I'd been the sound guy, the projector guy, all that stuff. And I just said one day, I'm like, hey, today's my last day. Didn't say why. I just disappeared. And I went into the wilderness. And it was three years. For three years, and I, I'd like to say it was all good. There was three years of, what are you doing? Do you hear me? There was some of that. And that's okay. He'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. He can work with cold. Lukewarm, you don't even know. Because you're so darn comfortable, you think everything's all right when it ain't all right. And I knew it wasn't all right. But I couldn't put my finger on the problem. And it took three years. And he revealed Torah to me. He revealed a whole bunch of stuff to me. Yeshua had a wilderness experience. Yes, even Yeshua needed a wilderness experience. Matthew 4.1, then Yeshua was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay? The breath of God, the Ruach, led Yeshua into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To, for him to be tested to see if he was fit for ministry. And many of us, and I believe anyone that's being called into ministry, is going to have to go through the wilderness just like Yeshua did. Amen. It might involve, I don't know if it's going to involve fasting for 40 days, but it's, there's going to be some testing because there's testing in the wilderness. If Yeshua was tested in the wilderness to see if he's ready, I believe we will be too. Paul, 
This is what Paul said, Shaul, Galatians 1, 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not rush to consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to the apostles who came before me. But I went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Only after three years did I go up to Jerusalem to confer with Kephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. Okay, so Paul... We know he gets this revelation on the Damascus Road, right, of Yeshua. And then he's, was that, uh, well, it was Damascus, I guess. And then, yeah, he gets his eyesight back later and all that stuff. And it says here he went into Arabia. Well, there are certain theories on this, that the mountain of Yah is in Arabia. He may have gone to that same place that Moses and Elijah went. Maybe he needed a new revelation of who this Yeshua, who he just encountered, on his way to Damascus was. We don't know exactly all the details, but we know that Paul went down into the wilderness. He probably had to be, uh, do some detoxing from all his years of being a Pharisee. Do a little religious detox. All right? Some of us have needed to do, do that, and some of you need to do that. But he needed to be detoxed from Judaism and, Phari and Pharisaicalism. Galatians 1.11 says, For I certify to you, brothers, that the gospel I preached was not devised by man. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Yeshua Messiah. Well, I believe that's where it took place. That's just my personal opinion. I can't prove it. But he went to Arabia for a reason. He didn't bring a caravan down there from what I can see. He went down there, and at some point, Paul gets a revelation. And I believe that's where it took place. Because that's the pattern I see all throughout Scripture. It's people going into the wilderness to get delivered, and to get revelation, and to encounter the Lord. But the revelation that Paul received was limited. He would later go and spend time in Antioch, and I think that's where he truly learned the fullness of Messiah, with others, as we're called to do. So lessons from the wilderness. Right? We are told not to conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Right? We are not to be conforming to the pattern of this world. That is why we need to learn and go into the wilderness. It takes faith to inherit the promises of God and leave the wilderness, though. So God's going to meet your needs in the wilderness. We saw the manna, the prophecy in Hosea, in Revelation. He will meet our needs. He's going to take care of us. And we know that Yeshua is the manna in the water. And you will, but here's the thing I can learn from the children of Israel. You will grow weary in the wilderness eventually. These people had manna brought to the tents every day. But eventually they grew weary. You know why? Because we're not meant to pitch our tent in the wilderness and live off manna. Although it's good, and for some of us, I know for me, when I was in the wilderness, my personal wilderness experience, it was great. It was like drinking from a fire hose at times. It was like you could almost, it was like coming so fast and furious. You're learning more in three months than you did in three years. And you get all this great stuff, but it's still manna. And some of us were starving in Egypt so much in our religious bondage, in those churches, we were, those dead churches we were sitting at, that, that that manna that the Lord was providing for us every day in front of our door seemed like a feast. And we don't ever want to leave because we're like, wow, I'm growing. I'm eating for the first time. I'm, 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 I'm getting something for the first time. But it's still not enough. Eventually, you will grow weary in the wilderness. You're not meant to pitch your tent and stay in the wilderness permanently. Just like the children of Israel. They were not meant to stay in the wilderness. The wilderness was the place to pass through. It was the place to get purified, cleansed, and prepared for the promised land. So the manna is made to get you through the wilderness, not to live off permanently. The, the abundance of the promised land is to be lived off of. So we're supposed to be moving on to bigger and better things. Leaving Egypt and Babylon is not enough. And that's another thing. The children of Israel, well, the, the Judah, when they left Babylon, they had to go through the wilderness the other direction. We don't really ever think about that. But they had to pass through it as well. So yes, going in the wilderness, it empties us of religious baggage and is a religious detox. All right, Deuteronomy 6.23 says this. In the future, when your sons ask you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws Yahweh our God has commanded you? 
Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, Yahweh sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. So I'm just going to pause there for a second. That's the reason he brought us out of Egypt. It wasn't to live in the wilderness. They lived there for 40 years. That wasn't the point. That wasn't the plan. The plan was to bring us out of Egypt to bring us into the promised land. Because he had promised it to Abraham, right? Yahweh commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear Yahweh our God so that we might always prosper and keep, be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before Yahweh our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So it's interesting. If our children ask, what is the meaning, what's the, what, what's the reason for these laws, these decrees? We can point them back and say, hey, we had ancestors who were slaves in Pharaoh, to Pharaoh. They were slaves, but he brought us out. Hebrews 3.15. When, when it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, they, as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So that was the big mistake. In their wilderness experience, they did not have faith. So... One of the things we can learn from the wilderness is it's a kind of a, it's a message of salvation. I got a little picture I made to illustrate this. Kind of looks like a flag. All right, so the children of Israel, they're in Egypt. And the Lord saves them from the hand of Pharaoh and his army. So while the children of Israel are in the wilderness, they could say, yes, Yahweh saved us. If someone came up to them, hey, when were you saved? Yeah, a couple weeks ago, the hand of Yahweh saved me from Pharaoh's army. They are in the sea. They are drowned and dead. While they were in the wilderness, Yah was saving them every day. And they were called to work out their salvation with fear and trembling every single day. But they lacked faith. They did not endure to the end. And like we just read in Hebrews, they did not enter his rest. The promised land is a picture of salvation. And the children of Israel lacked faith. They didn't follow his commands. They were unfaithful. They didn't have the faith to enter into his rest. So we just read in Hebrews that they did not enter his rest. And this is, what, this is the problem today in modern Christianity. They have a saved past tense approach. I was saved. They're resting on the past. Yes, he saved you from Pharaoh's army. Hallelujah. So now what? You still got to follow that pillar of fire or you're going to get left behind and you're going to die in the wilderness and you're not going to enter his rest. You still have to obey the commands he's giving you or you are not going to enter his rest. So every day, you have to choose whom you will serve every day. Not just rest on the fact that you did it once, you answered an altar call, you got baptized three years ago, hallelujah. You don't get to rest on that. That's all in the past. Every day, you have to choose whom you're going to serve. Every day, you have to decide whether you're going to live for you or live for him. Every day, you have to decide whether you're going to die to self or not. It is a daily thing. We have to practice presence. The presence of the Lord, we have to practice that. He is here right now because we are here right now. We brought him with us. He's in you. And it's so easy to lose sight of that on a daily basis because we can start focusing on what's seen rather than what's unseen. But every day, I would urge you to practice the presence of Yah, knowing that he's with you, that you bring him with you. You bring him to work with you. You might be the only one bringing him to work. You might be the only light in that place. You might be the only one in your household. 
But be faithful to that. And know he's with you. Practice that presence. Know he's with you every day. But they didn't do that, and they did not enter his rest. So we are saved. We're working on our salvation. And if we endure to the end, we shall be saved. It's a three-step process. But the church has this wrong. They just look at the past. I was saved. And now I can live for myself. Now I can do whatever. I'm under grace. And that's not how it works. He's coming for a bride, not for a whore. That's strong language, but that's just true. And that's just it. So Yeshua says to follow me. Matthew 16, 24, he says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In fact, Matthew 10, 38 says, Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So we have to decide to do this every day. Are we going to take our execution stake every single day and die every day? Because that's what it means to follow him. Matthew 4, 19, he says, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So following him is not just for you. It's so that you will then go and get others. What is the first thing Andrew did? It says in John chapter 2, I believe. It says the first thing John did is he went and got his brother Peter. And he said, we have found the Messiah. It's the first thing Andrew did. We talk about what would Jesus do. What would Andrew do? He would go tell somebody that he found the Messiah. Okay? So you finding the Messiah is, hey, hallelujah, but it ain't just for you. It's so that you can follow him and become fishers of men. And there's some people, there's some fishing ponds that you guys fish at that you're the only one fishing at. There's some, there's some fish in the pond at your work, and you're the only fisherman in there. Matthew 19, 21 says, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. This is what he told to the rich young ruler, right? And that man went down, walked away, opposite direction with his head down, downcast, upset, sad. He was invited to follow. He was invited to follow the Lord. Not, not everyone got this invitation to walk with the 12 and follow him. And this man did. But his stuff got in the way. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's John 10, 27. There's been lots of religious leaders in this world. And they don't say follow me. They say follow my teachings, follow my writings, follow my creeds, follow my religion. Amen. Yeshua doesn't call us to follow those things. We will follow those things when we follow him. But I don't follow a moral code or a religion or rules. Yes, I, I, I observe Torah because he is the Torah. I'm not following, I'm not going away, I'm following the way. The way is a person. I follow the truth because the truth is a person. I follow the life because the life is a person. And this thing is all about Yeshua and following him. Because he will lead you into the wilderness, but he's not leading you to the wilderness to stay in the wilderness. He says, follow me, because he's telling you to follow him into the promised land. He is preparing a place for us. That is what he told his disciples, that he was going to prepare a place for us. So yes, you can pitch your tent in Egypt. There's lots of worldly pleasures there. And you know what? It all looks good. It looks good when your flesh is alive. There's a lot of things in this world that look good. And the organized, Babylon, the organized religion of Babylon, some of that looks good too. There's a lot of people falling for that. It looks religious. It looks pious. It looks holy. And there's a lot of people that want to pitch their tent in Babylon. And there's a lot of people that get called into the wilderness. And they receive a revelation of the Lord. And he shows them the truth. But unfortunately, a lot of people pitch their tent there too. But he wants you to pitch your tent in Zion. He wants you to come up to the mountain. A lot of times we get hung up on the future kingdom that we forget that the kingdom is at hand. You can live kingdom life on a daily basis while you wait for the kingdom. You can. You really can. But you have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness in order to do it. 
Leaving the wilderness is temporary. Your faith will be tried. And leaving comes with a cost. And many don't leave. But everything in the, in the wilderness is temporary. Exodus 23, 20. See, I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Now, there's different theories on who that messenger is, whether that's Yeshua or not. But I know that that messenger, that angel, that Malak, it says that he is there to guard them and protect them in the wilderness along the way. To, but he's there to bring them to the place that's been prepared. Yeshua has gone on to prepare a place for us. That's what we're marching towards. We don't want to stay in the wilderness. We want to move on. Because he's calling us to go to that place that he's prepared. And that's the promised land. Like I said, the wilderness is not enough. Just like the garden wasn't enough. The garden of Eden wasn't enough just for Adam. Yahweh wasn't even enough just for Adam. As blasphemous as that might even sound to some of you. He created Eve because he knew that it wasn't good for man to be alone. It's not good for you to be alone. You are made to freely share Messiah with others and be in fellowship, koinonia, as the body, to be in community, in a place of joy and love. And that's where you're going to fully live and grow. That's where you're going to thrive. You will not thrive in the wilderness. You can get a revelation. You can get deliverance in the wilderness. But after that, you need to find community. And there's a lot of lone rangers out there, a lot of lone wolves. They have church hurt. And I get it. There's a lot of people that Yahweh is calling to come here or coming to a, or called to your home fellowships or wherever you came from, but they're reluctant because they have some church hurt. And church hurt's the worst hurt. The people that were supposed to love you didn't love you, and they wounded you. But you know what? The healer can heal you. you got to give that hurt to him. You might be saying, well, you, Victor, you don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they did to me. You're right, I don't. But you might seem like you have a right to be angry, and maybe you do. But when you live for him, you give him all your rights. So now, you don't have any rights anymore. When you follow him, you hand him all your rights. Your right to be angry, your right to offense. You don't have a right to your rights. If you're going to follow him. <laughs> so yeah, Elijah, Paul, Yeshua, they were all in the wilderness. They all had amazing experiences. They, Yah revealed themselves to them. They got... They got protected from their enemies. Whatever he did to, in the wilderness was amazing. And I had an amazing wilderness experience too. But eventually I had to come out of my wilderness and get connected to brothers and sisters. Because that's how the body works. He does not want an isolated body part in, staying in the wilderness. He wants them to come out then and then be connected and grow. Because again, it's not just for you. You being part of the body, yes, you're going to grow and you're going to be blessed by your brothers and sisters, the other body parts. But the body's not fully represented unless you're there. Because you're bringing a body part that was missing. So we need you too. And so this message is for everybody. Nobody's excluded. Because we are all parts of the body. He is, of course, the head. But the ecclesia, the body, the church, his bride, that is our natural habitat. And that's where we're going to live and grow together. And it's going to be trying. You know why? Because people suck. Plain and simple, people can suck, all right? And sometimes you're just going to have to embrace the suck, okay? But people can suck, all right? It's just real. That's why Paul said in Ephesians, I think it's chapter 2, 3, or 4, he says to be long-suffering toward one another. That one another that he's saying to be long-suffering toward is actually your brothers and sisters in Messiah. It's not the world. He's not saying be long-suffering to the world. He's actually telling us to be long-suffering towards one another. That means I'm going to have to suffer you. To suffer the things that you're going to do to me for a long time. That is what long suffering is. Because you're, you're going to give me suffering for a long time. And I'm going to su give you suffering for a long time. Okay? Being in a fellowship is messy. It can be messy. Because we're, we can be messy. Because we can be, because people are there. Okay? The perfect church is, I guess, the one without people. <laughs> in, in some people's minds. Not, not in his mind. But Yah is building a spiritual house, and we are the living stones. And we go through the wilderness to get to this place. It's to get here. Not just MNLT here, but here as the body, to get connected together. 
And there's a cost to get to this place. And some of you know it. Some of you have lost some family members along the way. Some of you lost some family or friends. They think you're crazy. Think you're in a cult. Oh, you've heard that? Someone else has heard that? Okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> so there's a prophecy. There's some prophecies. I, I just took a handful. There's pl- plenty more like this. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. The wilderness and the land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So the children of Israel, they've known this for a long time. They've known that one day... God is going to make the wilderness a place of life, a place where rivers, if you notice, there's, all these involve water, don't they? There's some, I think there's some verses in Jeremiah that kind of echo this as well. Springs of water, rivers. We know that Yeshua, during the feast of Sukkot, on the last day when they're doing the water libation ceremony, he said in John 7, 37, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Well, that's only going to happen when you follow him and when you seek his face. And many people today aren't seeking the face of Yah. They're seeking his hands. There's two kinds of seekers. If you were to see a homeless person on the street, they're not seeking your face. They're seeking your hand. When they're like, hey, you got something? I'm hungry. They're looking to see. They're watching your hand. They're looking to see what are you going to give them. In the book of Acts, I think it's Acts 2, 3, 4, around that neighborhood. Peter and John go up to the temple, right? There's a man begging. And Peter says something really interesting. He says, they saw him. He's asking for alms. And... It said that he looked him in the eyes and he said, look at me. Silver and gold have I none, right? But possessions I give, I give thee. In the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He said, look me in the eyes. Seek my face. Don't seek my hand. We are not to seek the hand of God. We're to seek his face. He's always telling us to seek his face. Why? Because that's where the desire is. That's where the love is. That's where his countenance is. He doesn't, don't seek him for what he can give you. You're not a homeless person. You're not a beggar. Don't look to what he can hand you. Seek him. Seek the beauty of the Lord. And then Paul does the same thing later on in Acts, like Acts 16. Paul is walking and there's a man. He said, Paul saw that that man had faith to be healed. And he told the man, look at me. I tell you, when you witness to people, don't wear sunglasses. Even if it's a sunny day, let them see your eyes. See that they love, that you love them. Let them see the countenance of your eyes, that you love them. They might question your message, but don't let them question the messenger and the spirit you bring. People think the message I bring is stupid, and that's fine. They can reject, they're not rejecting me, they're rejecting him. I don't take it personally. But I'm not going to let them question my motives for sharing what I'm sharing. They're going to know I love them. They might think I'm crazy, but they know I love them. And that's how it should be with all of us. But we are to seek his face, not his hands. And when we seek him, we'll find him, especially when we seek him with all our heart. We have promises in the Bible. And one day, he's going to make these dry wilderness places, those dry places you've been going through, he's going to turn them into a beautiful place. This right here is going to turn into that. That's what he's going to do. So I'm going to conclude with this. Everyone needs to go through the wilderness. Everyone's going to have to go through their own personal experience. And you might have to go back again because you, you didn't learn from the first time. When leaving Egypt or Babylon, you must go through the wilderness, but you can't pitch your tent there. Like I said, he's bringing you through it because he's got a place for you, a place of connection, a place of fellowship where you can now thrive and grow and see the full body of Messiah represented more clearly. Because if you're just by yourself, you're just one piece of the body. He wants us to all come together in unity. And you know, that unity doesn't always mean 
unity in doctrine or calendars or pronunciations? Because I probably disagree, and you probably disagree with me on a whole bunch of stuff. But we are united in his body. The broken body. The blood of Yeshua. That was spilled for us. The blood of the new covenant. That is where we have unity in what he did. Not unity in our doctrines, our thoughts. It's our unity in him. In him only. And what he has done to unify us. And we know that's what he, he said. The world's going to know us for our love for one another, right? Not for our tassels, not for our head coverings. Those are all good things. But that's not how the world's going to know our love for one another. So we've got to go through this wilderness so that when we get together, we can be purified. All that religious garbage that was in the past, we left it in Egypt. We left it in Babylon. We left it in the wilderness. Let the sun dry it out. It could just rot. We're not bringing it with us into this promised land, this place that he's brought us together. The wilderness is a divine requirement. I believe everyone has to go through it personally. And you might be resisting it. But by resisting it, you're resisting him. And if you're being called into the wilderness, run, go. There's a fresh revelation of him waiting for you. Deliverance is waiting for you to be set free from the bondage of Egypt or, or Babylon. And if you've already been through the wilderness and you're in a good place, well, then testify of it. Share it with others. Like I said, it wasn't just for you. You have a testimony. You got free from something. Live now from a place of freedom and victory in Messiah. That's the thing. The wilderness, if you went through the wilderness, then it's in the past. Now you can live in the present, the present of victory. When, that, when the enemy whispers in your ear and tries to remind you of who you used to be, no, that's not who you are. You're a child of Elohim. You don't even need to ask, who am I anymore? I know that song's popular, who am I? But I know who I am. I am who he said I am. And I can walk in that every single day with confidence. And it's not because of anything I did. It's because of what he did. And we can walk in that confidence every day. So yes, now that if you've walked through that wilderness and if you've been set free, you've had a fresh revelation of who he is, now it's time for you to point people to him. Because like I said, it wasn't just for you. All right, I'll close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Let your word be true, every man a liar. Your word says that what the children of Israel went through in the wilderness is an example for us. May we never forget what they did. May we, it always be a reminder that we could very so easily be susceptible to the mistakes they made. We are not above that. So I pray that we will always remember the mistakes they made and learn from them so that we don't repeat them. I pray if you're calling anyone here into a personal wilderness where you want them to get alone with you, surrender things that haven't been surrendered. If there's religious baggage, if there is sin, if they don't truly know who you are, I pray that they would seek you in the wilderness, in the secret place. And they, when they seek you with all their heart, you would reveal yourself to them because you are a God of, who keeps his promises and your word says that you will. And I know so many other brothers and sisters, including myself, who have sought you with all their heart, and you've revealed yourself. It could be a time of testing and frustration, as it was for me, but you purified, you purified us. You cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And I thank you so much for this Feast of Unleavened Bread, this time we could spend together. And I pray for all the other speakers that speak the rest of this week. I speak nothing but blessing over this entire week, that we would grow together in you, in unity. I pray that our love for one another would continue to grow and our love for you would grow and you would show us truly how to empty ourselves and to consider others better than ourselves and live for one another and live for you in victory and freedom all the days of our life. And I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.